The decisions we make with our hard-earned money have huge ripple effects on our future, so today I wanna to share with you four financial decisions to avoid if you want to create a life full of financial abundance. So for today's video, I've decided to team up with a friend of mine and fellow YouTube creator, Sean Solo. Sean is extremely wise financially, brings a ton of value to his audience, and is gonna share with you our first financial decision that keeps you poor, which is not keeping track of your finances. Sean? Thanks, Mitch, I'm excited to be here. So let's talk about tracking your expenses. It's important to track your income and your expenses to make sure that you're not overspending or living beyond your means. It's hard at first, but it's kind of like training a muscle. Once you get started, it becomes easier and you get in the habit of living within your budget. It's especially rewarding to see your net worth start to go up after a while, which gives you motivation to keep going. So track your income, your expenses, and your net worth. Make sure you're also tracking your savings rate, the debts you're trying to pay off, and check in on your investment accounts. Now, to take things to the next level, start setting your financial goals. Money is just a means to manage your life, so what are your goals in life? Is it to get out of debt? Is it to generate other streams of income? Maybe it's simply to plan for your retirement lifestyle and start saving up towards that. Without a destination, a roadmap is pretty useless, so make sure you set those goals early. All right, so our number two poor financial decision is simply not investing at all. The 90-year history of the stock market shows that over the long term, you'll make passive income by earning dividends, the value of a diversified portfolio will appreciate in value, which all means that your wealth will grow exponentially. I totally understand the fear of losing your money in a wild stock market correction or crash, especially in volatile times like the coronavirus, where we saw the S&P 500 lose almost 40% of its value in just a few short weeks. However, as I said earlier, history shows that markets always recover over time, and if you're playing the investing game for the long term, you should have no worries whatsoever. The same can be said for the value of real estate and rental properties, which are historically even more stable than the stock market. That being said, the biggest risk that you can take is keeping your money in cash sitting in a bank account or underneath a mattress somewhere. Seriously, if you're doing this, don't do this. Also, what's your address? At best, you're only gonna be making one or 2% in interest and your money will be devaluing over time due to inflation. So keep a solid emergency fund in place, invest the rest, and you'll enjoy an average eight to 12% return per year on your money. And speaking of your money devaluing, Sean is going to bring us our next financial decision, which is too much consumer debt. You bet. So I'm gonna talk about four types of consumer debt here. The first one is car loans. Even if you can get around the crazy interest rate with 0% APR, it's still kind of a ridiculous concept to pay for a car with a car loan. Essentially, you lock into a long-term loan, could be three, four, five years, and by the time you're done paying off the car, you'll end up paying more than the ticket price, and the car will be worth about a third of what you paid for it anyway. So it's like a lose-lose situation. To make matters worse, by the time you get to the end of your term, the dealership is already trying to tempt you into a new vehicle to keep the debt cycle going. They make it really easy to roll over into a new vehicle. So the rule here would be to make sure the value of all your vehicles is less than half of your annual income. Next would be your student loans. This makes up a huge chunk of people's debt. The average student loan debt in America is $32,000 and pretty close $35,000 in Canada, according to a survey done last year. If you are still in school, help yourself out. Apply for bursaries and scholarships. Stay in province or in state. Don't pay the extra fees to go to a foreign school if you don't have to. And of course, work and be responsible with your money while you are still a student. You might be able to get out of that debt free. A good rule here is try not to end up borrowing money for school that would be more than your first year's salary when you get out of school and get a job. Next are big mortgages. Now, for most of us, this makes up the majority of our debt. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a mortgage or, or a debt for your house as long as it's affordable. What my wife and I did when we bought our house 
house is we actually got a house that was half the value of what the bank recommended that we could afford. This ensured our payments were really affordable and just in case something happened and one of us lost a job, we'd still be able to pay for our bills. The biggest thing to avoid here is don't get a bigger or fancier house than you need. This is a huge place where people try to keep up with the Joneses and remember the Joneses are broke. Try to make it so that your mortgage payments are no more than 25 to 30 percent of your take-home pay. That's after taxes. Finally, the biggest consumer debt and probably most important is credit card debt. Again, there's nothing wrong with buying things. The important thing is that you're able to pay off your credit card every month. Spend money on things that bring you fulfillment. Otherwise, there's that temptation that credit cards give you where you can always pay it next month and that sends you down the slippery slope of spending more than what you can afford. And the interest rates are crazy. The rule here is if you can't pay for it in cash, don't pay for it with a credit card. And if a credit card is messing you up, cut it up and use a debit card or pay cash. That way you're only spending money that you have. All right, thanks, Sean. So our last financial decision that keeps you poor is not taking advantage of tax-sheltered investment accounts. In a traditional brokerage account, the dividends, appreciation, and capital gains you earn will be taxed as ordinary income, which for some high earners could be as high as 30 or 40%. Luckily, there are a plethora of different investment vehicles that you can use to keep as much of your earnings and growth as possible. Now today, I'm not going to go into the rules and restrictions for each of these accounts, but I am going to share with you the best order in which to use these accounts to maximize your returns. And for all my Canadian friends, Sean is going to share with you the Canadian equivalents to these accounts after I do. Oh, so first, if your company offers a traditional or Roth 401k with a match, always take the match first. This is the only type of investment that automatically doubles before you make any money from earnings and growth. Pretty sweet, right? The next step would be to open up a traditional or Roth IRA for yourself, which has very similar tax benefits as the 401k, but with a little bit more flexibility on withdrawal and use. You can fund up to $6,000 per year into this account and either pay no taxes on the money going in or pay no taxes when you withdraw in retirement. For both the 401k and IRA, I usually recommend choosing the Roth over traditional method, but this all depends on your income and retirement goals. The next best thing would be to go back and max out your 401k contributions to take full advantage of its wealth building power. Now at this point, if you're self-employed and hence don't have the option of a 401k, you may want to consider opening a SEP IRA in place of or in conjunction with your IRA. But before you open your SEP, make sure you understand the rules for if you use these together or separately. Now these next two accounts you may want to consider using before you max out your 401k to ensure that you get a broad diversification of uses for your money. In conjunction with high deductible health insurance plans, you have the option to open up what's called an HSA or health savings account. There are three main tax advantages here. Your money grows tax-free, you can pay for your medical expenses tax-free, and if you're healthy and don't use your health insurance very often, you basically end up saving money on your premiums. Depending on your situation, you may choose not to pay for your medical expenses using your HSA, keep your receipts, and then reimburse yourself later down the road. An HSA does have a limited amount of uses and ways that you can spend the money before retirement, but it's a great way to use another powerful wealth building tool. And lastly, if you have children, you may want to consider opening up a 529B. Like these other accounts, the growth is tax-free and you can use this money to fund your child's educational costs down the road. If you start when they're born, you'll have 18 years of growth tax-free to make their college and university costs significantly cheaper. Thanks, Mitch. So I'll quickly just do the uh, American to Canadian translations here. So a 401k is equal to a direct contribution plan, which is usually arranged by your employer here in Canada. A traditional IRA is the same or very similar to an RRSP. A Roth IRA is similar to a TFSA. And an HSA, we actually don't really have those in Canada. They're not um, independently run, but HSAs can be provided by employers. We just usually aren't able to invest in. And finally, a 529 is similar to an RESP. Okay, back to you, Mitch. I hope you were able to learn a thing or two today about some decisions you can avoid to maximize your income. 
And a huge thanks to Sean Solo for collaborating with me on this video. Make sure to like and subscribe to both of our channels, and I'll catch you on the next video.